I'm happy to inform you that our longer wait actually clap as she comes in. It's befitting. Your Highness, Your Royal Highness, Mama Nabagedeka Sylvia Najinda Ruswata, we are really in honor, uh, honored to host you today. Thank you for accepting Makere University's invitation. It's indeed a very important day for us as we celebrate the powerful uh, women in Uganda, Your Highness, all of us look up to you, especially the ladies, but I know also the men, because where there is a great man, there's a great celebrating uh, the legacy of Sarah Nyandoha Ntiro, who was the first graduate in East Africa. I would like to welcome all of you. I also want to honor Mrs. Anna Rizman, uh, the representative, can, country representative of Conrad and Noah Foundation, who have funded the entire function. Thank you so much. Without any more performance, I'd like to invite the Department of Performing Arts and Film to lead us into the anthems as we open this function. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Department of Performing Arts and Film, headed by Dr. Benon Chigozi. Thank you. We can uh, sit. I would like to invite I would like to once again welcome all of you to this very important uh, function. I would like to welcome Her Royal Highness Mama Navagereka Sylvia Najinda Ruswata once again. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Princess Katerina Sarah Nkoba Zambogo, sorry, Sangari Ambogo. I'm so excited. She just recently graduated with a bachelor's degree in business administration. Thank you so much, Mama, for nurturing her. As women, we are very much inspired. Thank you. I would also like to honor the presence of uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, and your dear wife, Mrs. Susan Nawangwe. We know that where there is a great man, there is a great and powerful woman. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for also allowing us to see her. Thank you. I want to honor uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, in charge of administration and management, uh, Professor and Finance, Professor Alini Chwe uh, Henry. I want to honor again uh, Mrs. Anna Reisman, who is the country director, please stand up the country director of Conrad Adnar Foundation, again, who have allowed us, enabled us to be here. I want to honor the academic uh, staff, professors, uh, please wave so that people can know you are present. Thank you so much. I also want to honor the council. I'm sorry I'm not following any protocol. I've saw some council members here. Please wave to us. I can see council uh, is there. Uh, there are also a number of other members of the management. Please wave to us. I want to also acknowledge the presence of the family of uh, our legacy woman, Sarah Antiro. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Honorable Miriam Atembe, you are here. I introduced you, but many people had not come. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, amidst us, we also have Dr. Edward Kayondo, who is representing the Budonian. You know, Budo and Buganda are very, very, uh, it's a very connect, big connection. Uh, without any more uh, uh, performance, I know we are kind of trying to redeem the time. I want to invite the chair of Nkoba Zambogo for only two minutes uh, to come and welcome uh, Mama Nabagereka Sylvia Najinda in our midst. Uh, Mr. The chair is Adrian Rubiai. Thank you. Ah, uh, Jakusava Abantu Bakatonda Abantu Basava Saja Kabaka Abakungani Dewan Muchfochino Mwani Rize Mama Naba Girika Ninga Riza Mai. Ezengalo tezimala mama naba gireka. Nobeto wazo ubu nje nyo. 
Nja kuba sabamu anilize Omumbe ja Katrina Sangali Ambogo Nja kuba sabamu anilize musajja waka baka Vice Chancellor wa fe na wangwe Nja kuba saba, tuanigizo mkungu wa saba saja kabaka, Sara Nkonge, Dokita. Nja kuba saba, tuinu muima wa fuwanko wa zambo go, atukozo burunji ubuta gambika, ukututeka teka, Profesa Sauda na Miyal. Nja kuba saba tuga tenga toze engaloze zimu. Tuanilize omukungu Adrian. Atuala echitongo lecha mama naba gireka. Echa naba gireka foundation. Mama naba gireka. Tusanyu senyo njini. Okula bako wanukasozi makerere. Banako bazambo guba anji. Bavude matende kera genja uru. Iranja kuba sababu imirile. Aba ntubala viva nanko bazambo guba bali wano. Okuwa aniliza mama nawa girika. Banako bazambo guba imirile kuba bakubile mungalu. Mweba rinyo, mweba rile dala. Mukama wange mama. Nze Adrian Rubiai. Nedira angabi, akabiro jere ngesa. Dimu saja munabudu, nzikiriza mwekerezi ya katolika. Nkola somori ya busomesa, elandi mwaka kwa ngegu wa kusatu. Kuluwechi sacha ya katonda, nzisi sentelewe jerinu, ilia saba saja kabaka, niva nangebano, mumakere university. Oruwa lero, nga tuchia aziza mama. Nja kusaba bantu baka tonda fena bali wano. Tubeko, nebye tuigira kumama, sirivia na jinda. Obweto wazewe, chumuchikubili nga tonda. Mwanzikiri ze, nkume wano, Hai katonda kuma mpuroguma ya Buganda. Thank you so much, uh, the chair of Nkoba Zambogo in Makere University. I've been reminded that I didn't introduce myself. Um, Professor Sylvia... Antonia Nachmera Nanyonga Tamsuza. I'm a professor of music. I'm also the head of grants administration and management support unit of Makere University. At this moment, I would like to invite um, Associate Professor Sarah Sari a member of the Senate. She's also a member of the governing body, the University Council. Please join me to welcome Professor Sarah Sari. Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. I think there's a lot of protocol that has already been observed by our MC, Professor Sylvia Nanyonga Tamsuza. And in the same vein, standing on that same protocol, allow me to welcome you to Makere University once again. Uh, our dear Vice Chancellor, 
and all invited guests. Today is a great day when we focus on the legacy of a great woman who, who was a trailblazer. It is a really great day, and I would like to begin by thanking the leadership of Makere University that has enabled us to be here. First and foremost, I would like to thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Banabas Nawangwe, has not only been a great administrator, but he has been inspiring intellectually. He, his era or his legacy will be forever noted for the intellectual revivalism in this university. Okay. I know we are gathered here, but I can assure you there are many other events of intellectual nature taking place in different parts of this university or of this country, courtesy of Makere University. So it was not by surprise that last year, when the university was celebrating 100 years, that we as faculty were encouraged to find great names to celebrate. And we were very happy when the vice chancellor and his team thought it would be worthwhile committing one of these big lectures to celebrating a woman icon. And that woman was Sarah Antero. Maybe we shouldn't have been so surprised given that our VC has always been a champion of gender equality, both in word and in deed. Even before he became a vice chancellor, I can tell you he was behind the construction of the School of Women and Gender Studies. So whenever you pass by and see that beautiful building at completion, please remember Professor Banabas Nawangwe. Now, coming to the school, the School of Women and Gender Studies has been around for now 32 years. And uh, one of the reasons it came to be was to train a critical cadre of gender analysts, gender experts. That would impact Uganda and Africa at large. And we are proud to say that it is, one of the, it is the biggest and oldest school of gender studies on the continent. But that would not have been enough. With, it would not have been possible without people like Sarah Antero. Because Sarah Antero was among the women, as a member of the University Women Association then, that championed for the formation of the School of Women and Gender Studies. They championed for a critical training of intellectual cadre in the field of gender studies. And that's why when we had the opportunity to celebrate a woman or to, to, to ask the university for a memorial lecture, we comfortably and eagerly suggested the name of Sarah Antero. So wherever she is, we thank her and we thank the women that she worked with. Now, be, because of her legacy, many women have traversed and excelled in higher education. But we know that that alone is not enough. Beyond the numbers, there are structural barriers to gender inclusivity that continue to be devil the workspace, the private space, things that are beyond just having women there, things like gender, I mean, things like gender-based violence, things like gender discrimination, they keep changing forms. And that's why it's very important that today, the world is moving beyond numbers to address the structural barriers of gender inequality. And for that reason, that's why we are happy today to have our chief guest, our keynote speaker, who I'm not qualified to introduce, will be, she will be able to introduce, focusing on her journey hoping that through her journey, we can get to understand how to give women a voice so that it's not just about presence, but it's about the voice 
that women occupy so that they can transform the spaces that they occupy. And these discussions are very important because as Africans today, we are in the age of decolonization of African knowledge. We are in the age of recentering African knowledge. And that is very, it's very good that we are seated here today to look and reflect on gender studies through the lens of two great women, Sarah Antiro the Trailblazer and Her Royal Highness, who is going to give us excerpts from her book on how women can traverse and women can conquer spaces using other forms. And this is to demystify the view that gender activism, gender equality is only a thing of the Western world. African women have been powerful. African women have conquered spaces. African women have transformed society. And we are privileged today to have the opportunity through the lens of these two great women to reflect on that journey. So women's empowerment is not only a thing of the West, but it is a thing of all of us and in all communities. And decolonization is very important. Centering African knowledge is very important. And that's why once more I thank the Vice Chancellor for giving opportunity and celebrate and space for us to celebrate these kinds of things where we take the gown to the town so that together we can build a more inclusive society. So mine were just a few brief remarks to welcome all of you to this great day. It's not for me to give a speech. And uh, as I conclude, once more, thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for the opportunity and for inspiring us. And uh, as recognized before, this would not have been possible without Pastor Susan Nawangwe beside him. I know the Vice Chancellor was also recognized by Nkoba Zambogo as Omsajawa Kabaka. So I also want to use this opportunity to recognize Mrs. Susan Nawangwe not just as Mrs. Susan Nawangwe and the wife of the Vice Chancellor. She's also Pastor Susan Nawangwe. She's a prayer warrior. And some of the peace and tranquility you see is because of actions of powerful women like that who are battling and acting in places that you don't see but become transformatory to the society. <laughs> Once more, allow me to thank Mrs. Anne Reisman, and the Conrad Adenwa Stiftung that has funded this entire event. Conrad is a key partner of Makere University. And uh, we, like we have very many other partners, but for today we are celebrating Conrad for enabling this event. Thank you very much. Each time we've always had a need, we've run to you and you have met it. And uh, we also acknowledge our other partners as will be acknowledged by the MC as we go into the event. So thank you very much for turning up and please sit back and enjoy because the menu our queen has for us, our mama has for us is a great menu. Lastly, I shouldn't go out without thanking the family of Sarah and Tiro who have lent us the name of the icon to celebrate. You know, it's not easy to celebrate people without, I mean, you know, when you're celebrating people who are not here, it is a delicate balance celebrating the people and celebrating those who have lived beyond the people. So we acknowledge the family of Sarah and Tiro in all your generations. We are told there are four generations. We thank you that each time we have reached out to you as we organize these functions, you have come through for us and made it easy for us to celebrate. Once more, thank you for lending us the name. So thank you very much, Madam MC. I would like to stop here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sarah Sully. I would like to honor the presence of Honorable Maria Chiwanuka, who is here in many capacities. She was a former Minister of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development. But I also know that she's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Nabagedeka Development Foundation. You are very much welcome. I also want to honor Owechiti Wa Kotiri Danakate, Minister Wevi Njigiriza, 
nemirimu agent kizo mu office ya nabagereka i also want to honor the uh, OHT wa mugero akasule uh, minister na ye mu mu bwaka baka bwa buganda OHT wa and professor masagazi masazi you are very much welcome I would also like to honor uh, the board member of the develop Navagetica Development Fund, Dr. Maria Nasali. You are also very much welcome. We also have Dr. Sarah Nkonge, uh, and also, who is also uh, serving in we also, I also, I'm also informed that we also have the UN country director, uh, Ms. Elzili Atafur. Thank you so much for being here. We know you've been a great for honoring our invitation. I also live streaming by the vice chancellor, our host, uh, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. You are welcome. <laughs> Princess Katrina Sangaliambogo, the ministers from the Kingdom of Uganda. Your Excellency and my dear sister, Elsie Atafwa, the UNDP country representative, the country rep of Conrad Adenua Stifton, Honorable Maria Kiwanuka and Honorable uh, Miria Matembe, my predecessor and mentor, Professor Livingston Rivovi, <laughs> members of Makere University Council and Senate, members of Makere University Management, the Dean School of Women and Gender Studies, the family of Sarah Ntiro Nyendroha, all members of staff present, Makere University alumni, including my dear wife, Susan Nawangwe. Our dear students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. It fills me with immense pleasure to warmly welcome you to the second Sarah Ntiro Annual Public Lecture, a demonstration of Makere University's commitment to continue honoring and perpetuating the legacy of a trailblazer, distinguished alumna, exemplary educator, and a relentless advocate for various causes. With the aforementioned attributes, you can discern that the late Sarah Nyendroha Ntiro was loved by and therefore considered by various institutions, organizations, and advocacy groups as their own. Be that as it may, none of them was as close to heart as the family. I would therefore like to thank the family of the late Sarah Ntiro for the continued collaboration with Makere University to honor her legacy through this annual public lecture series. We thank you very much. <laughs> In a special way, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Her Royal Highness, Navagirika Sylvia Naginda, the Queen of Uganda, back to Makere University. I recall with nostalgia your visit to Makerere on 21st October 2011, 
when on the occasion you donated computers to our gender mainstreaming directorate. I think you gave them the very first computers they ever had. So that was very powerful. This gesture as the patron of the female scholarship scheme and female scholarship foundation not only struck a chord with us then, but also augurs well with our theme today, catalyzing change, women as pillars of society. Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Mackay University has since 1945, when we refined our motto from let us be men, because there are only men, to we build for the future. Makerere has been at the forefront of catalyzing change that positioned women as pillars of society in our country and the region at large. I must report to you, Your Royal Highness, that because I think of the heroism of Sarah and Tiro to come and study among men and then opening the doors for all the other young girls. Makerere now has more female students than male students. I think that was unimaginable at that time. Sarah Antiro Nyendroha received her teaching certificate in history, geography, and English in 1950 and went on to teach at Kievambe Girls School before proceeding to St. Anne's College at University of Oxford. Eunice Luvega Posnanski, who was the first Uganda wom Ugandan woman to obtain a bachelor's degree from Makerere College in 1955, like Sarah Antiro, proceeded to the University of Oxford for her further studies and later on to Ghana and the United States where she enjoyed an illustrious career as a librarian. On 20th February 1959, Professor Josephine Namboze became the first female to graduate with a licentiate in medicine and surgery, as it was called then, from Macquarie College. The licentiate enabled its holders to apply to join the British Medical Council and practice medicine in Britain and throughout the British Commonwealth countries. Professor Namboze, at over 90 years of age now, continues to inspire and mentor many women, not only in the medical field, but also all other spheres of life. Unfortunately, our time today does not permit me to share the countless examples of females that have etched their names in our annals of history by virtue of their prolific achievements. However, permit me to share just two more recent examples. 23rd May 2022 will forever go down in history as a remarkable day for the female scholarship at Macquarie University. On that day, Dr. Caroline Adok became the first female to be awarded Macquarie University's prestigious Doctor of Laws in our 100 years of existence. I, I hope you can understand what that tells you, that it is not easy to get a doctor of laws at Makerere University. That same day, at 31 years of age, Dr. Olivia Navawanda became the youngest female to obtain a PhD in mathematics from Makerere University. I wouldn't be surprised if she was up supervised by Professor Lwovi. As remarkable as these achievements are, and not to taking any credit away from the hard work of Dr. Deutsch and Dr. Navawanda and their supervisors and mentors, they, these achievements, are a stark reminder that at slightly over 100 years of existence, Makerere can and ought to do more. As Vice-Chancellor, therefore, 
I wish to reassure you of the Mackay University leadership unwavering commitment to do more to catalyze change that will position even more women as pillars of society, particularly through academic scholarship and early career mentorship. The humiliation that Sarah Antiro was subjected to her, subject to by her mathematics lecturer, which forced her to leave the class and pursue history, geography, and English instead will never be repeated again. <laughs> Not here at Makere, at least. At this juncture, I wish to pause and clarify that there is absolutely nothing wrong with pursuing history, geography, and English at Makere University. What is wrong is having to be forced to take a different path through discrimination based on your being either female or male. Therefore, through the Mackay University Agenda Equality Policy, the Mackay University Policy and Regulations Against Sexual Harassment, the Affirmative Action Policy providing for a 40% enrollment quota for female students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics have been instituted. We also have regulations and policies through which we have established that, facilita that, that facilitate the institutional regulatory environment that guarantees our students, particularly our mothers, sisters, and daughters, the support and freedom to freely choose and pursue their full academic potential. Your Royal Highness, as I conclude, I wish to thank you for accepting to be our keynote speaker today. I also thank you for the wonderful work you are doing for our country and, for make, and particularly for Makere University. As I was discussing with you before we came here, I am particularly impressed by the resilient execution of the Ekisakate program. Which has, which has even gone beyond the borders of Uganda, and to which you have actually added mindset. And uh, inspired by you, we are also introducing a program in mindset education at Makere University. <laughs> when we established the female scholarship scheme, we also established the female scholarship foundation and we had no doubt as to who should be its patron. And we thank you for having provided leadership for that very important initiative of Makere University. Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with these few remarks, I once again warmly welcome you to Makere University for the Sarah Ntiro Annual Public Lecture 2023, and wish you fruitful interactions as we build for the future. It is now my honor and privilege to invite your Royal Highness to come and give your keynote address. Welcome. Please take your seats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Ministers from Uganda Kingdom, the chairperson and members of the University Council, members of the family of the late Sarah Ntiro, 
the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Banabas Nawangwe, members of the university management and staff, distinguished panelists, undergraduate and graduate students, Bankoba Zambogo, Sanyusenyo Okubalawa, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to join you all this afternoon as we remember and celebrate the life and legacy of the late Sarah Ntiro. I thank the university leadership for making the Sarah Ntiro public lecture an annual event, which I believe is an affirmation that the inspiration we need for both our current and future generations need not be foreign. I thank the organizers of this memorial lecture for inviting me to deliver the keynote for this year's annual memorial a lecture under the theme, Catalyzing Change, Women as Pillars of Society. I'm indeed grateful to the University Council, the Vice Chancellor, the University Management, and the School of Women and Gender Studies. I will begin my address by sharing my understanding of the word pillars and women as pillars in society. There are many definitions, as you can imagine, many definitions of pillars. The one that caught my interest is that pillars are necessary for the survival of society because they represent strength, stability, and support. Mr. Vice Chancellor, as an architect, I'm confident that you appreciate the value of pillars for structural support. At an individual level, I believe that a person who is a pillar in society is respected, selfless, reliable, decent, hardworking, and is more of a giver than a taker. Pillars of society live purposefully, are present, have self-acceptance and esteem, and are responsible, assertive, authentic, trustworthy and respectful of others. Women as pillars in society. During the Cultural Revolution in China, Mao Zedong said, and I quote, women hold up half the sky. I find it most appropriate to contemplate the lives of women like Sarah Ntiro, Joyce Mpanga, and Rhoda Kalema, who are instrumental in catalyzing transformational shifts in the lives of girls and women in Uganda. The former United Nations Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan said, and I quote, study after study has taught us that there is no tool for development more effective than education of girls and the empowerment of women. No other policy is as likely to raise economic productivity, lower infant mortality, or improve nutrition and promotion, and promote health, including the prevention of HIV AIDS. When, a woman are uh, when women are fully involved, the benefits can be seen immediately. Families are healthier, they are better, they're better fed, and their incomes, savings, and investments go up. And what is true of families is true of communities, and eventually whole communities, end of quote. Centering women in our social development discourse is very important, and one way of doing this is by amplifying their seminal contributions towards achieving impact in different fields. 
I want to elaborate on how women are indeed catalysts of change through their tireless efforts, advocating for the needs of girls and women's human development, particularly in education. Now, going back in history, in our history, some women and men have championed the right of education for girls and women. The inaugural Sarantiro Public Memorial Lecture um, dwelt on her outstanding achievements and contributions to society. And so I will not repeat them today, but rather bring in her peers, such as uh, Joyce Mpanga and Rhoda Kalema, who I mentioned earlier, as having been equally instrumental in catalyzing change in the social status of women and girls. I cannot talk about my journey, as the first speaker mentioned, without talking about the great women before me. In her autobiography, titled, It's a Pity She's a Boy, Joyce Mpanga describes how, as a member of the Uganda Council of Women, she had the opportunity in 1964 to travel to Washington, D.C. to attend an international conference where she met the former First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, who handed her the monetary award she had received at the conference for her outstanding work. She narrates how on her return to Uganda, she passed the money on to Uganda Council of Women for education grants for women. Later, later in her political career, she used the offices she was appointed to to advance the causes of girls and women. In her book, she describes how, as president of the National Council of Women, she lobbied President Yoweri Museveni for a policy on women that later in 2007 saw the establishment of the Ministry of Women Affairs in the president's office and her as its minister. During this period, Sarah Tiro was the head of the NGO department in the prime minister's office. One of the many groundbreaking and change-making actions Joyce Mpanga has, was able to accomplish was to have a little funding that her ministry was allotted in the 1988-89 national budget channels to education of women initiatives, and she also influenced input on women in the Odochi Constitutional Commission. Those are just some of the many contributions that Mchala Joyce Mpanga has made in education. Now, Rhoda Kalema, in her autobiography, My Life is But a Weaving, identifies Mary Stewart as having established the Uganda Association of University Women to address the low enrollment of women in university, including older women at Makerere College. This saw the knowledge that later Eunice Lubega of University Women and the Director of Women's Education. Naroda Kalema, as the National Resistance Council representative for Chiboga District, worked hard to improve girls' access to education and to reduce girls dropping out from primary schooling, working from the Forum for African Women Educationalists Uganda chapter, to which she was a member. Rhoda Kalema worked, on, worked to provide scholastic materials and secure scholarships for disadvantaged girls in her district of Chiboga. Now, Forum for Africa Women Educationalists Uganda chapter has accelerated female participation in education and has narrowed the gender gap. And in smart successes was only made possible by some women who came before, who dared to demand a riding on the shoulders of these women and all the progress made and improved status to them. According to Rada Kalema, it began with prominent women who were members of the multi-racial and multi-ethnic Uganda Council of Women, 
namely Eseza Makumbi, Barbara Saben, uh, Catherine Hasty, Shugra Vishram, Mahera Ahmed, and Himtani Bhatia, who influenced policy issues and decisions that impacted the lives of women. It was the Uganda Council of Women that turned the tide that ushered women's participation in political decision making. Getting a seat around the decision and policy making table. Among the many things the council did was the promotion of training of nursery school teachers based on the knowledge that early childhood education is the foundation for learning for all children. Women are the backbone of families and communities. They provide care, support, and nurture mental well-being. Women's organizations, initiatives, and leaders have played a critical role in empowering women and enabling them to be active citizens, live dignified lives, and thrive as human beings. An empowered woman is a better person, mother, worker, and citizen, capable of taking advantage of opportunities to, co to contribute, to lead, make changes, have her voice heard, and skills employed. Now, being the Naba Gerika has provided me with the opportunity to realize my dream of making critical contributions to the development of my own country, something I had constantly earned to do during the 18 years that I spent studying and working in the United States of America. The Naba Gerika Development Foundation, which I went on to establish in 2000, responds to the needs of children, women, and youth. For over 22 years, the foundation has been actively involved in numerous health, education, and community development uh, initiatives. Our mission is to leverage culture to improve the economic and social well-being of children, youth, and women. Which the professor just mentioned earlier, uh, which I also established in 2007, it builds on the early realization of the importance of children's holistic development by the phenomenon women I mentioned earlier and on those on whose shoulders we still ride. Exakarecha Nabageka continues to promote the nurturing of children in environments where learning and skilling happens and other needs are met. And over the years has become a time-tested attitude and behavior adjusting intervention that is held during school holidays and that has impacted the lives of over 35,000 girls and boys directly and millions through broadcast media and online. Now, the interventions in Echsaka Recha Nabagirka are informed by think, thinking, rooted, it's thinking rooted in culture, that among other things, it enag a sense of pride and dignity in our rich culture heritage. The interventions aim at enabling the girls and boys to embrace aspects of culture alongside aspects of modernity. This intergenerational transfer of positive attitudes, knowledge, values, and life skills is in recognition that children, as the leaders of tomorrow, need good educational, cultural, skilling, and emotional grounding. The Tsakate was introduced and embraced in Canada, South America, South Africa, uh, United Kingdom, as well as the United States. In 2017, Ubuntu Bulamu, which amplifies Ubuntu, which is the African philosophy that espouses interconnectedness, humanity, uh, dignity, and communal living was integrated in Echsakate Chanawagirika. Several societal values that make up Ubuntu Bulamu were identified through research, and these are self-reliance, uh, responsibility, respect, self-control, uh, 
humility, civility, integrity, honesty, sense of shame, responsibility, among others. These values, sorry, these values are found within communities throughout Uganda and are universal. Now, the Navigator Development Foundation combines the traditional value system of Ubuntu with contemporary value systems to promote moral, just, and dignified societies. The shared ethic of Ubuntu Bulam builds character and serves as a connecting thread between people from different nationalities and ethnicities. Now, culture as a tool for development. I wish I had some tissues. <laughs> no? <laughs> Thank you. Get some tissues, please. Thank you. Thank you. back in class. <laughs> okay, in promoting the value systems based on Ubuntu Bulam, we are careful to separate uh, positive culture traditions from the negative ones. Negative culture values and harmful practices uh, undermine the integrity of the society, especially that of women and girls. Echakadich and Navageka promotes are the positive culture values in order to build gender equality, strong families that grow and work together to nurture and shape the character of children, I encourage communal support, build unity and a sense of belonging and that values other than human beings. Now the adage strength of the chain lies in its weakest link, or uh, uh, put differently, is when the most vulnerable of us are free and thriving, that we guarantee our collective survival and happiness. Now, with the support of UN Women and uh, UNDP, the foundation, the Navagarika Development Foundation, partnered with the kingdoms of Acholi, Alur, Bunyoro, and Busoga, to come up with an indigenous approach to achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We have also worked with uh, African queens and culture women leaders from the kingdoms of Ghana, South Africa, Lesotho, and Nigeria, mindful that we have the power to use our privileged positions to improve the, to improve the lived realities of our people, as the saying goes, to whom so much is given, much more is expected. In 2022, I established the Nawagirika Nigeria Women's Fund. That was last year. And this was established to raise financial resources for the consistent investment in building peaceful, joyful, progressive, and self-sustaining communities. This fund is created and championed by women to reshape the philanthropic landscape and unlock opportunities for social investments that achieve scale, geographical reach, and establish the legacy of enduring sustainability. Now, my address uh, also echoes the voices in my autobiography, which intends to inspire readers to embrace their own passions and to strive for positive change in their communities. In short, it gives an insight into my life, tracing my journey from early years to becoming the Navagirika, exploring my formative experiences, education, and the profound impact of my family's heritage on shaping my character and values. My story sheds light on the challenges I face as a public figure, and it explores my role as a wife, mother, and diplomat, highlighting the delicate balancing act I have to perform 
between my royal duties and personal life. As the narrative unfolds, the book dolls into my pursuit of empowering women, promoting education, and championing social causes which become the driving force behind my initiatives, which range from advocating for girls' education, for su supporting maternal health and women's economic empowerment, as well as establishing the Chisaka teacher Nawagirika. Now, in light of that synopsis, I'll highlight some lessons learned, which also speak to strengthening both men and women as pillars of society. Now, a pillar reinforces the structure. We're all in agreement with that, so. Be a source of inspiration to others. Be the star to shine light on others and afford them the grace to flourish as their true selves. Remember, people want to feel wanted and respected, serve to serve. Be confident, take the often dreaded first steps to challenge the status quo of inequality and happiness, discrimination among others. Have integrity. Who you are when no one is watching is paramount. Character is often a leader's most valuable commodity. Love thy neighbor. Tolerance and diversity are essential. But without an appreciation of who we are can or how we coexist to reach out and understand our neighbors. When we appreciate our uniqueness, we are better able to reach out to others perceived to be different from us. I'm also enthused by the writings of the famous Latin American philosopher and medical doctor, Don Miguel Ruiz that emphasize four agreements which I also subscribe to. Find your rhythm, live your dream, take care of yourselves, fill yourself up, and be kind to yourself. <clears throat> be impeccable with your word. Start with yourself and keep your word to self and others. And number three, do not take anything personally. Understand people's point of view. Do not, take do not make assumptions. There are infinite ways or forms of who we can be. And lastly, always do your best. Put your ideas into action. Be present in the moment. In conclusion, I believe the world needs more of Saran Tiro, Joyce Mpaga, and Rhoda Kalimas, and many other outstanding women that I haven't mentioned today in our history. Secondly, there are infinite possibilities of the human potential to dream and break new ceilings. Thirdly, pillars in society have a responsibility to open doors, to open more doors for others to access opportunities, resources, and freedoms, irrespective of the differences. And finally, we need to apply ourselves for a better today and tomorrow and a future for everyone. Together, we achieve more. I thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. This really helps. I should have had this from the beginning. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to invite the Vice Chancellor to um, say thank you to our mama. Thank you.
Royal Highness, thank you very much for that powerful keynote address. Uh, we have a small gift for you. I would like, at Makerere with Develop Talent, I would like to invite Brian Anaman. This man is a, is a very powerful, talented fellow. He has, a, he has a drawn your portrait completely in a pencil. Not enough. Let's give another applause. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank uh, Brian. Brian is a music, is a drama student, so he's really very uh, multi-skilled, uh, and he's also an artist. In Uganda, we have a saying, Mama, tuagalo kwebaza, webale nyo okubulidira obuganda, no kutukuza, tumuongero obugalo. Before I continue, I would like to honor uh, right Honorable Margaret Ziwa, the former Speaker of the East African uh, Assembly. Thank you so much for honoring us. And we'd also want to make uh, a correction here. Uh, we talked of, uh, we are having the United UNDP resident representative, Elsley Atafoa. Uh, the program presented uh, a different uh, um, uh, description. We apologize for that. Uh, I would also like to honor our Vice Guild President, Her, Excellent, Her Excellency Mariat Namiro. Please stand up for honoring. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Livingstone Lubobi, thank you so much. He's also our former Vice Chancellor. Thank you. I've also seen our academic registrar, Professor Mukadas uh, Buyinza. Thank you so much. And then I've also seen my namesake, Professor Sylvia Tamale. You are very much welcome. I think our due time is now to hear about the catalyzing, challenging, uh, catalyzing challenge women as pillars of society, having an academic discussion, having a public discussion. And at this note, I would like to invite our, uh, the moderator of the panel to come and invite the panel on stage. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sarah Sari, the Dean, School of uh, Gender and Women's Studies. You're welcome. Well, it's a great day and a great honor. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for the great menu you've given us. And it is this menu that is going to lead us into the panel discussion. As you may be aware, our theme today is catalyzing change, women as pillars of society. And the keynote speaker has done a great job to it by summarizing it for us. And especially this bit where she talks about a pillar as a support for a structure. And if that structure is attaining gender equality, you know how big the structure is. 
you know how many pillars that we get. Some pillars have been there and left us, like Sarantiro, but there are many pillars today that are still doing a great job, like our keynote speaker and the many characters or icons she mentioned and those that you know. Just to remind us, actually, the overall objective for today, as has been explained, is to discuss the role of women as catalysts for social change in modern times. And to amplify this more, we are going to have a panel of three great women who are going to share with us how they have, what part they have played and how they have contributed to this bit of transforming society. Our first panelist is Ms. Elsie Atafua. Ms. Elsie Atafua is a resident representative, United Nations Development Program, UNDP. She is the UNDP resident representative for Uganda. In this position, she represents, leads, and is accountable for harnessing and directing the full potential of UNDP's capabilities and associated partnerships in support of national development goals and strategies in Uganda. <laughs> Prior to this, she led, managed, and coordinated UNDP's climate and forest yeah. team, <laughs> thank you, and office in Africa, and provides overall strategic direction, policy, and technical guidance to 28 countries in Africa's portfolio. Her professional experience spans years of working with UNDP, the global mechanism of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs, the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, government ministries, private sector, and civil society. She has contributed significantly to the establishment of partnership and financing platforms, networks, and alliances, and has led the design and implementation of major country and regional programs. She has extensive understanding of and knowledge in international financing mechanisms, instruments, and modalities. I know she's already here, but please clap for our powerful pillar. <laughs> our next pillar, or panelist, is Ms. Anne Reisman. Ms. Anne Reisman is the current country representative for the Conrad Adenoa Stiftung, Uganda, and South Sudan. For 15 years, she has been actively involved in European and international cooperation. From 2008 to 2010, she worked as deputy country director of the Conrad Adenoa Stiftung in Ukraine before managing a Brussels-based project of the European Network of political foundations on the EU enlargement towards the Western Balkan countries. Between 2012 and 2019, she served as policy advisor for the Andean countries, Central America, and Mexico at the headquarters of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung in Berlin, Germany. Please clap for Ms. Anne Reisman. Our third great panelist and pillar is Martha Kiza Kalema. Martha Kiza Kalema is the granddaughter of Sarah Antiro. She's currently working in the Central Bank of Uganda as portfolio manager in charge of the, in charge of the Petroleum Revenue Investment Reserves, and she has been working in Bank of Uganda for 11 years now. Her work experience spans years of working closely with the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and the Norwegian Oil and Gas for Development Program in Uganda. She has been actively involved in girl empowerment through the Girls for Girls program in Uganda, and has set up a program to empower women achieve their goals called Girls and Goals, which has several members around the world. She has extensive understanding of sovereign wealth funds investment, fintech, and is in all things a woman's woman. Welcome again, Martha Kiza. <laughs> so that's going to be our panel today. And before we start, maybe I would just like to guide 
that if you have any questions, please write them down and send them to the front. Thank you very much. So you're very welcome, panelists. We are each going to have five minutes to talk about yourself and how you have grounded yourself in the topic that our keynote speaker gave us. I know you all work for different agencies, but we are going to take it step by step according to our different mandates. So we are going to begin with Ms. Elsie Atafua to share with us in reference to what the keynote speaker said, what we are doing for women's empowerment as structures of society. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. And first of all, let me follow the protocols a bit uh, by appreciating Her Royal Highness, uh, the Nabagareka, Sylvia Najinda, a very good uh, leader and who, a woman who has inspired many of us and to appreciate uh, Professor Nawangwe and the team here in Macquarie University, uh, to thank the uh, Sarantiru family and uh, all the professors, uh, Professor Sally yourself, uh, Professor Josephine, Sylvia, and many more who have been supporting this. And let me simply say, you know, all protocols observed in the interest of time. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Nawangwe, for having me here, I come through the doors again, yet again, uh, to this very wonderful university to be part of a conversation which is happening at this time. And what a good segue uh, that our keynote uh, speaker shared with us some of the perspectives that uh, we can build upon. But I want to keep the conversation a bit light and I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about us collectively in terms of the theme and how we can catalyze change and promote women's empowerment and leadership. And uh, let me uh, simplify it because we have a number of students here as well. I try to cluster the conversation around what I call the six Ps. It's very important, the six Ps. So if you forget about anything, don't forget the six Ps as we leave here this afternoon. Uh, first of all, to, for us to catalyze change and, and to really promote that, uh, which empowers women, I think we need to be able to, first of all, celebrate the progress. It is very important for us to celebrate uh, the progress that has been made on women's empowerment. And today we are here celebrating Sarah and Chiru, which is very powerful. It's a powerful way of telling the story, but it's also a powerful way of catalyzing change because when people hear that story, they get inspired and they also want to do something different. So let's celebrate the progress that has been made. And in that regard, I want to appreciate what the government of Uganda has also done. I think the story is very clear. We have a female vice president, uh, it is not a coincidence that we have a female Speaker of Parliament. It is not a coincidence that we have a, a female Prime Minister. We have Cabinet Ministers and many, many more women who are here. We must celebrate the progress and we must tell that story in a very powerful way. Because catalyzing change means that African women must tell the African women's story. And uh, Your Highness, recently I went to Ghana. And when I was, I flew via Kenya and I took Kenya Airways and I flew, the pilot, the captain was a female uh, called Jeanette uh, Mathenge. And so I was very excited, it was a female pilot and I said, to, I told my son, oh well, we must take a picture with her. And when we got down, she said, why not come, let's take a picture. She even made her sit there, you know, she showed him a few things in there. So when I got home, I told my friends, I said, oh my God, it was so nice, it was a female pilot. And one of my friends said, oh my God, I'll die if it's a female pilot flying a plane. And I said, but why would you panic? She said, the first time I flew and it was a female pilot, so I didn't sleep in the plane. And I said, why didn't you sleep in the plane? She said, I was so scared. And it just told me something. And I said, but there are many Janet Mathengas flying planes every day. Who will tell their stories? And we must tell the African story. And so catalyzing change means that we must tell the African story in a powerful way. And by sheer serendipity, when I was coming back, the captain again was uh, a female uh, captain. And, and so why am I saying this? I'm saying this that for us to be able to catalyze change, we must come out, just like you have done HRH, 
uh, telling your story. We must tell that story. And I think I ventured a bit this year when I turned 50 years. I said, why don't I tell my story? Because I grew up in the ghettos of Ghana. And I grew up in a space where women were socialized into gender roles that gave them very restricted expectations of themselves. Uh, we lived in a compound house. I mean, there were no, you know, fancy things there. You know, you went to, it's pan latrines, everything. But now you become a resident representative of United Nations Development Program, which is the largest development agency in the United Nations family. How do I tell my story? And so I decided to do something and tweet us something, went on LinkedIn, did something. And it was such an amazing thing how many people and how many young women got in touch with me and said, you have inspired us. Tell us some more. And so in an era of digitalization, in an era of Instagrams, in an era of we must find spaces to tell our story. Until the time that we can celebrate the progress, then we will not be catalyzing change. Because change comes with telling the African story but in a very powerful way. But it's not only those that we can see, but even celebrating the unsung heroines of Africa. I mean, our grandmothers, our mothers, my mother who, grew, who brought me up as a single mother, we must be able to tell those stories. And I think that is a, a message that I wanted to leave with us. So that's the first P that I wanted to talk about, celebrating the progress that has been made. The second thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of the context and the conversation today is about purposefulness. And I think uh, Herrera Han has mentioned that word at some point in her speech. We need to be purposeful. In other words, change doesn't just happen. It will not just happen. We must be able to trigger that change. We must be able to bring it to life. We must be able to do something for us. So we must be purposeful. And why must we be purposeful? Recently, our Secretary General launched a report at midterm of the Sustainable Development Goals. We have, you know, the 2030 agenda. And uh, uh, seven years to go, he's launched a report. And the report is very interesting, very mixed results. And one of the things that struck me that it would take 281 years at the rate we are going to bring gender gaps. It might take us around 140 years to, to, to balance female and male representation at a high level. It might take us 300 years to address you know, child labor and many, many more. So when you begin to put the development perspective and you give it a lens, the world we are in there, where we have made great progress in technology, but we still have huge inequality and poverty. We must be able to bring women's empowerment, gender equality at the center of development. If not, we'll be just on the peripheral things and 100 years down the line, we'll still be talking about poverty eradication. And so we must be purposeful in terms of what is the agenda that we must change. And that is both at an individual and also at an institutional level. I make it a point myself that there are things that I must change and I must be deliberate about it. And I'm very deliberate about supporting women and women's leaders. And sometimes we do that, we do that overtly and for the lack of a better word, covertly. You must be able to support purposefully. So that's the second P that I want to talk about. The third one that I want to talk about in the interest of time is about promotion. We must not only be purposeful, we must not only celebrate the progress, we must be deliberate about promoting it. And so when uh, Herrera Highness talked about the fact that you know, he, has, he has established a fund, we must promote it deliberately. And on our side as UNDP, what are some of the things that we are doing? And it's quite interesting that we are on this ground in Makerere because we were part of a team that's helped with the establishment of the, of the, of the women's studies uh, uh, department here in Makerere. Um, please clap for that as well. We, Anne Rabo Chiwanuka was telling me that you, don't, you 
you guys are a bit modest, you don't talk too much about yourselves. But uh, when Uganda's own uh, uh, constitution, which is very gender sensitive, we were part of it in the early 80s. Uh, we were part of the establishment of what you have seen today as the Ministry of Gender and Labor and Social Development, which evolved over time. We were part of that history. Uh, we've been part of a very uh, powerful instrument of work, which we call the Gender Equality Seal which is basically that we are saying that for private sector and the public sector, we want to see gender equality in the system, in your institution, in your policies, uh, in your structures. And by promoting gender equality and women's empowerment, you get a gold seal, and that gold seal testifies uh, the work that you have done. I'm glad that Professor Nawangwe and the team have, uh, have endorsed this thing and are going through that process. And now we have over 90 companies here in Uganda that have uh, subscribed to the gender equality seal, and some of them have female now CEOs, and we believe that uh, our work and support has also contributed to that. And I can go on and on some of the things that we are doing. But one of the things that we have been concerned with in the UNDP, and of course, by extension, the United Nations family, is on gender-based violence. I mean, some of the things you hear and some of the things you see is very pathetic. And so we have rallied around that. We are working with the uh, European Union and a large number of UN agencies um, to be able to address uh, gender-based violence uh, in this country. And so there are a number of things, and I don't want it again like to, to, to go on about what we are doing. But promotion at an individual level is one of the things that I want to leave, especially young uh, people uh, here with. Myself, as a, a young Ghanaian who grew up in the, in the ghettos of Accra, I, I, like I said, you know, you grew up with very restricted expectations of yourself and there's something in you, there's fire in your belly which says that I need to change something. And therefore, going through the motions of, you know, uh, breaking some of the structural issues, the barriers and, uh, and, and getting to the point where, where I am today, the question I ask, I ask myself, what more can I do? What more can I do? What more can I do? And that individual desire to be able to promote a cause. And the cause always is about the development agenda and the role of women in that space is one that has continued to inspire me um, to move on. And any time we come out of our street and I tell my staff members, we come out of Yusuf Lule, and we see the women with the children in the back who are running down the street trying to make a living. And we see the men trying to make a living, we must it must tell us something, and we must try to distract that. And so for me, uh, that development course, and the passion and the loyalty to the course, and uh, here in Uganda we say, for God and my country, is something that remains with me. And two quick things, or three quick points, because I know other panelists have to speak. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is around partnerships. Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. And one of the sad things when I was growing up, uh, and you keep hearing that sometimes in circles, is that women are their own enemies. And I think that needs to stop. Uh, and we must be deliberate. Please feel free. We must stop it. Partnership is very key. And partnership not only with women and women movements and women's causes, uh, but partnership also with men. Because we, also, we need them on our side. And I think catalyzing back again to the conversation around catalyzing change is one that we have to partner with one another, especially women. And I think about, I think three or four days ago, I was, uh, I was just talking to myself and I said, there are a number of things that I see. I said, where are the women activists? Where are the movements? Where are they and how can we support each other on the cause? And I saw those partnerships, what networks uh, are very important. When Her Royal Highness talks about Ubuntu Bulamo, we know it's a passion of her. The question then is how can we partner with her to push forward a cause? So the partnership becomes very important amongst us as women, amongst us as youth, but also with the men becomes important. And two quick points as I, as I conclude around what we can do in terms of catalyzing change is, uh, and I think uh, the stars were aligned and we were in sync, Your Royal Highness, uh, when you talked about the other P pillars. And because you dwelt upon it in depth, 
I will not also go about, uh, you know, try to expand on it, but the word pillar um, came strong as I was reflecting on this pillars. What does it mean to be a pillar? To be a foundation, and again, she's espoused on this uh, pillar theme, and so I would, I would leave it. But when I was looking at the practices, and the statistics are very clear before us, uh, and that's my last P, the practices that must stop. The practices that must stop. We still live in an era where, for the same job, men are paid more than women. It must stop. We still live in an era where we still have female genital mutilation. Those practices must stop. We still live in an era where there's huge inequality on many fronts, and I can go on and on and on, and that must stop. So just in sum, uh, Professor Sally and team, um, and just uh, speaking both from an institutional and, and personal point of view, I just want to, to wrap up by saying that it will take us to celebrate the progress that has been made. Uh, as we celebrate Sarah Interior today, we must make it and must take it upon ourselves to celebrate many more women who have pushed the course of development and who have pushed the course of humanity and who have pushed the course of peace in the world today. And some of those are unsung heroines who will never be in these spaces. We must find them and we must tell their stories. And never again should somebody, a female, tell another female when another play, a pilot who is a woman flies a plane, I get scared and I get butterflies in my stomach because we are not telling the story. We must celebrate the progress. We must ensure that we are promoting partnership. We must ensure that those uh, discriminatory practices are stopped. We must ensure that the right policies are there and we can be the pillar that uh, we are expected to be. And we must ensure that uh, we again are uh, making sure that we are purposeful and we are positioning the women's agenda. And I hear in my career, for example, let me conclude because I'm very excited. A very practical thing, for example, is that we are helping to establish a daycare center uh, where women students, female students uh, who have children and lactating mothers and others can find a space to be able to concentrate on the studies, but when they have to go and breastfeed their children, they should be able to do that. And so these are some of the things that we are doing uh, but I'm happy to share my story. It's, uh, we have uh, a little sort of booklet that was published by UNDP on all the resident representatives, my story in India, which shows how I grew up to the, from the ghettos of Accra to where I am now and what has driven me to be here. And so again, congratulations on this day. Thank you for inviting us to be part of that conversation. The story must continue on Sarah and Tiro and many more African women and to celebrate their stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsie. That was really powerful and inspiring. Next, we are going to have Anne Reisman. And Anne, as you come on board, you know how when other people are constructing the pillars, sometimes they are those who are trying to dismantle them. And I know as Conrad, you work a lot in the area of politics. Please share with us your perspective on these pillars. Catalyzing change. Thank you very much, Professor Sally. Your Royal Highness, the Queen of Uganda, dear Vice Chancellor of the Makerere University, Professor Nawangwe, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and my co-panelists, it's really an honor to be here with you together, to listen to you, all of you, to learn from you, and to be inspired. And today I have brought with me my daughter, who is seven years old. Because I wanted her to also have the opportunity to listen to intelligent, dedicated, hardworking, and inspiring women.
We need to celebrate stories. <laughs> and we need listeners who do celebrate with us and who learn from these stories. And I think we, our generation, but also all of the women who come after us should look upon all the women all over the world who paved the, the way for us. And we need to know and acknowledge what they've done so that we can take on this work and continue by working hard, by being dedicated. My daughter's name is Matilda. And Matilda means mighty warrior. And we have chosen this name on purpose. There was one of the first regions in Germany who was called Matilda, and she was governing during the years 966 and 999. So you can imagine the story of female empowerment of women in the highest position is indeed a long one. We should appreciate it. It's not a story of nowadays. And already her grandmother established an abbey, so generations before. And it was one of the first places for education for girls in Germany what today is Germany. So that name was given on purpose to celebrate, to commemorate this story, to embed a human being in a cultural and historical heritage. But at the same time, and this came then with the baptism of hers, we gave her the baptism uh, verse, you have set my feet in a broad place. So that we, women understand there is a heritage, but there is also a wide place, a broad place that we need to shape. Whether she decides to do it or not, it's on her. But at least we have tried and we will do it in our families as well. And I think this is where it starts. The foundation of our societies begin in our families and our communities to make our children aware of the cultural and historical heritage. Now, as somebody who represents a political foundation, and now I'm coming back to your question, Professor Sally, um, I would like to also bring in a figure um, from the area of politics. And seeing Dr. Miriam Matumbe here, I think there would be many other ladies here in the room who could better talk about women in politics than maybe I, who I am just playing a role behind the scenes. But the figure suggests and I am now going back to the gender gap index. The gender gap index is basically reflects the path towards parity. So how many steps, how much have we come to this parity? If we are at zero, we have not even started closing the gap. If we, are, if we are at 100, then we are, we consider to live in a society where parity has been achieved. Now in politics and among different sectors that this index looks at, we are at our worst. We are at 22.5%. What does it mean? Because sometimes those percentages do not really, we cannot feel them. It means that it would take 126 years as of now to achieve gender parity. And this morning as I've been preparing um, 
for, uh, for, for today with my daughter, I asked her, what do you think? Is it good or bad that there are much more men in different sectors and also in politics than women? And she instinctively said, no, it's not good. And I asked her, but why not? Because it's not fair. So this is a very genuine answer of, of a little girl. But a part of, of the fairness, there is something else into it. And when we talk about politics, and I want to talk about politics as what we mean under the politics and not what we have experienced maybe over the years and what has become politics in our appreciation, but politics as affairs of the city, as managing public affairs, as uh, organizing our society to make decisions, how different groups come together to make these decisions, which rules apply, how are the power relations structured, and so on, how the resources are distributed. If in politics we do not have the voice of all the women and their dedication who could be in this space, we just miss out on certain perspectives. That's how easy and simple it is. Because the experiences of women are different. Their individual needs are different. They experience power relations differently. They experience safety and security differently. They have different support systems. And they also, again, experience them differently as the men experience their environment. So it, to be able to really manage the affairs of the city, because it's a Greek word, but we can go and say the, of the community, of the country, and so on, we need to bring on board these experiences just in the interest of better solutions with different, different perspectives. As I conclude, I would just like to uh, s mention a few structural barriers that exist uh, in the way of parity. And they are of societal character, of organizational character, and of personal character. If we talk about the societal aspect we talk about, for example, roles that we um, are used to, the behaviors maybe that are expected from us, and so on and so on. So our social environment and the expectations of the social environment vis-a-vis uh, -vis us. When we talk about organizational um, challenges, we talk about those challenges that smaller bodies organizations and institutions create they, that made it di more difficult for women to um, enjoy these spaces. I can give you one example. If one lecture uh, or one meeting um, takes place late in the evening, mothers will rush home. They might not be able just to be part of this meeting. So we need not only to think of the behaviors and so on, but also how to organize ourselves in the way that we can bring on board as many people uh, as are necessary to make uh, very comprehensive decisions. And the uh, private ones or personal ones are, of course, through which phase of life are we going? How will this impact my work and so on? And as you can imagine, those three areas, they are very much interdependent. How I go and my, uh, navigate through my life is very much informed by w what kind of organization I belong to or what is the society expecting from me or how are these entities supporting me uh, in my personal decisions. And as we celebrate uh, unique women and um, you know their boldness, their pioneering um, 
work, I actually would like to come to a point where we have institutions and society where maybe some of this boldness, strengths, and so on, not needed. Because you do not need to be a fighter to contribute to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. We are now going to another sector which has been the sector in which women's empowerment has been recognized most, and that's the economic empowerment. But we begin by reminding ourselves that Martha is from the Sarantiro family, and she had prepared a speech from the family. So in your remarks, you'll give us that speech, and you'll also give us what the outlook looks like from the financial side you stand. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I stand on all protocol observed, but I would like to say a special thank you to Her Royal Highness, the Navagarika of Buganda, and of course, the Vice Chancellor. Thank you for honoring my grandmother, Saren Tiro, who we used to call Akiki. Thank you for remembering her, and thank you for hosting this annual lecture because it brings us closer to her and it also keeps us as a family accountable to her legacy. Before I talk about the economic landscape, let me talk about who Akiki was, um, what her accomplishments were, and how we are doing our best to stay true to her legacy. My name is uh, Martha Kiza Kalama, as I was introduced and the incomparable Sarah Intero was my grandmother. And what a grandmother she was. She was like a force of nature. She was always reminding us that you must do better. You can be better and you are blessed so that you can bless others. I am sitting on the stage only because she stood on stages before me to fight for my right to speak. Thank you to fight for my right to be educated, but most of all, to do what I love and enjoy. I did my undergraduate degree in mathematics some time ago, and it was only when she stood up at my graduation dinner and said, Martha, my dreams have been fulfilled through you, that I remembered that she was stopped from doing mathematics so many years ago here in McCary. And I was standing on the shoulders of my own personal giant because it's impossible to have someone in your lineage who has been stopped so many years ago, and then decades later, someone stands up and does the exact same course, and I was doing it without even thinking. So, thank you. A Kiki, or Kiki as we had grandchildren fondly called her, was a woman who was dedicated to catalyzing change, but also to challenging gender norms. It was important to, it was important to her that women were not only educated, but they recognized that education was not just a privilege given to them by other people, but a right. And it was important for women to stand in all forms with their voices equal to men. She stood firm as a pillar of society and she always said, if the men can't hear you, then speak louder. Stand on the table, shout if you must, but always make sure that you have been heard. Many, many decades ago, Kiki tried to ride her bicycle through the streets of Hoima, something that I'm sure, if her mother hadn't stopped her, would have caused outrage among so many male villagers. But it seems today, as women, we're still struggling to find our places, to fit in society, and to lean into our greatness. Kiki reminds us to always challenge the status quo and that staying small and fitting in is not the safest path. It is always important to speak out, identify the barriers holding women back, and come together to find solutions. It is because of her actions and her passion that her, our family has third and fourth generations of women graduates, following Kiki and, of course, my mother, Mrs. Enid Kiza. And as a family, we continue to work hard to champion her legacy in girl-child education. In life, we were always playing catch-up with Akiki. She was so fast and always doing so many things. 
and it feels in death, it kind of remains the same. It's very difficult to immortalize the greatness of who she is and to bring honor to a woman so powerful and impactful. But we are definitely trying, and I'm going to take this opportunity now to share with you some of what us as her family are doing to honor her legacy. Recently, we registered the Sara and Chiro Akiki Foundation, the Sana Foundation, whose vision is inclusive, equitable, quality education in rural Africa. This foundation will take the lead in all legacy issues relating to Sara and Chiro, and aims to increase the opportunities for rural children, especially girls, young women, and people with disabilities. We have finalized Kiki's memoir, which will be launched on the 24th of November, 2023. I think there's a little sign up there. Ignore the date, it's 24th. Uh, we wish to recognize the support and patience of Femrite, the women's writers organization that spearheaded the writing of this book. As a family, we have continued to sponsor children because who suffered disadvantage. At the moment, the family is supporting over 40 children mostly drawn from Hoima, but spreading as far as Maracha district in northern Uganda. In collaboration with Spice FM, we are launching a program named Amaraka, which is a renewal word for voices. We hope to use this program to amplify girls' and young women's voices all over Uganda and hopefully throughout the world. And as a family, we're working on the Sarah and Chiro Center the center is to be established at Kiki's home in Kiganda in Hoima. It will house a museum of Kiki and her legacy, an art gallery, and a music room to honor Princess Jane Nsungwa, Kiki's mother, who was a music teacher. The Sana Foundation will unveil the first impression of the Sara and Chiro Center on the 24th of November when we launch her memoir. We're hoping that when you see these steps, they bring honor to her memory, and you see that we are doing things that immortalize her legacy. I'd like to quote from Grandmothers, a poem by the esteemed Maya Angelou, which I believe exemplifies who my grandmother was. When you learn, teach. When you get, give. As for me, I shall not be moved. Kiki taught, she gave but most of all, she would not be moved from what she believed in, whether it was equal pay for women, education for girls, or equality for women in all spaces. Kiki did not relent, and I sit here backed by thousands of women who owe their education and their places to her because she stood up, she fought, she shouted, she banged on tables, if necessary, <laughs> to make sure that she was heard in all spaces. Thank you, that was about Akiki. So if I can talk a little bit about, I currently work in Bank of Uganda, the central bank, and I work in finance and investments, and that is a space, even though there is a lot to do with economic empowerment for women currently in Uganda, finance and investment, we don't see you people, you people of Makar, we don't see you at all. Um, and we need women in those spaces because when I was studying my undergraduate degree, I remember one of my lecturers saying, and he was a man from India who taught the hardest calculus possible. And he always said that when you give a man money, that will be great, maybe he will buy a beer. Maybe he will buy a loaf of bread. But when you give a woman money, she will feed her whole community. She, so we need women in the spaces of finance and investment. We need women to stand up and take leadership in positions. I can give you an example of Bank of Uganda. I represent the class that, has, that is just having children. And it was difficult to even get a breastfeeding policy passed where you can have a room where you can breastfeed and express milk for your children. It's only when women, two women, stepped on the board of Bank of Uganda that we were able to get such a policy. 
because women know how other women think. They know what other women face. It's important for women to step into spaces and places where they don't think they even fit because look at me, I'm in oil and gas. How many women do you see in oil and gas? And when I step into places, people are like, Really? You're representing Bank of Uganda? Huh? Where, where is your boss? When I say, ah, I'm here. I am the boss. Why are you looking for someone else? What knowledge will the man have that I will not have? Why do you ask for a man when I am here? Why do I walk into a room and you look for someone else? So it is important for women to not only be financially literate, which we're trying to do as Bank of Uganda. We have exhibitions, we go out, we try to talk to you women, we try to bring women together to form circles, to empower each other. But it's important for women to say, I can do the mathematics that no one said that I could do. I can do the engineering that no one said I could do. I can be that welder. I can be a painter. I can be all those things because a woman will be more comfortable inviting a welder into her home than she would a random man. So why don't we step into those places? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martha. And thanks a lot to our great panelists. We are now going to go into a short session of question, questions to our panelists. We don't have much time, so we shall take just four. The rest, you can write the questions and they come to the front. I don't know who is moving the mic and who wants to be among the four or five. Please stand up and make your question. Tell us who you are and make the questions short and direct them to a particular panelist, please. Thank you so much. How are you, Highness? Now a Gary cast Liviana Jinda, the Royal Princess Katrina Sangaliambogo, members of Council, University Management, and all our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Namiro Mariette, and I'm the 89th Vice Guild President, Makere University. I have a few questions to our panelists and one to Her Highness, if I would be given the favor <laughs> to ask. The questions are to the panelists, but we shall just note that one. You will get it answered later. Thank you so much. Uh, in our pursuit to catalyze change, I believe that our focus wouldn't be only put on the ladies, but also the gentlemen especially those who have come here today because I believe they know the duty and the importance of women as pillars of change. <laughs> and my question about the men is how can we empower them to actively engage in advancing in gender equality and supporting women as pillars of society? Uh, then also, I think one of the speakers, Miss Elsie, talked about the different opportunities, the different partnerships that we can engage in in order to empower women. And my question is, which are these partnerships in civil society, in government, in politics? Which opportunities can we engage in which partnerships can we utilize to see that we empower women as pillars of society? Then my question to Her Royal Highness is, whereas we acknowledge the role of cultural norms in upbringing we the ladies, mothers of society, there are some of them that literally bring down women as pillars those that are hindering the change that we would wish to see in the future years. So how can we utilize culture to see that we do not undermine our roles as women in growing and being stronger pillars of society? Thank you so much. Thank you. We have for the... Yes? Yes, please. 
One question, please. That one was a vice guild president. She was her excellency. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my, uh, my name is Susan Narugwa Chiguli from the Department of Literature, Makere University. <laughs> my question is directed to Ms. Atafo. How do we change the mindset of both privileged and underprivileged women and men to begin to think in solidarity, to transform the space for women to achieve from all locations, whether rural or urban or the ghettos? How do we ensure inclusiveness in the drive to liberate women for, 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 for women freedom and progress so that in this room next time, when we have the Sarantiro public lecture, we also have women from Katanga attending whether they went to school or not. Thank you very much. There is a burning question here, moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor so Chiguli. Please ask. Yes. Thank you so much. I stand on protocol as early established. My name is Ruth Chitamirike. And my question goes to Dr. Elsie Atefa. I'm one of those young women who read your At 50 story. And even as you spoke, you said that you always felt the fire in your belly that there is more you can do. I don't know if you've interacted with many Ugandans, but I'm sure you have. And in there, I'm sure you have heard of the fact that many young people feel tired. They are so tired to do everything. They are so tired to go to the streets. They are so tired to advocate. And the same is even seen in the women's movement. I identify as a person in the young women's movement of this country, but you still feel that the energies are running low. So, and when they, they try to go high, it is usually looked at, say, in the language of UNDP as political polarization, which then has to be created seminars for on how we can really break the gridlock and stop the political polarization in young people. So how can we positively revive that fire and how can we positively encourage young women to actively stand up as we catalyze really for change? Thank you. Thank you. That was Rose, she was a former minister. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. My name is Chigundu Mohammed. I think I, sh I am right to say that I am a year one student of Masters of Adult and Community Education at Makere University. Mama Nava Gileka Tusavin Sokulaba. Now, my, I have two questions, please. The first question goes to Ms. Martha Kalema. Um, Uganda Bankers Association notes more women are employed in the banking sector than women than men by 52%. The vice chancellor of Makere University in his remarks notes that more girls are enrolled in the university than we boys. The question is then, presented with these facts, can't we safely say that we have crossed the Rubicon in the fight to create women pillars? The other question goes to Anne Reisman. Empowerment is a collective effort that can be significantly bolstered through alliances. What strategies or initiatives can underrated, under, underrepresented groups establish to form strong alliances that elevate women's status, enhance their opportunities, and drive impactful change within societies. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to request our panelists to respond to that. Please, any more questions, write them down. Please, Issa, raise your hand so that people can see you. Issa Mugabo is there, and uh, Rita. So please send the questions to them. We wish we could take every question, but we are running late and there are other events coming. So we are going to request the panelists to respond to those questions. It's not more than two minutes if you can, and you also do your wrap up as we do so. Oh. Do you want me to go? Yeah. Okay. 
So I think, uh, Professor Nawangwe, this is as a test, uh, testament that you have to do more of this. There were so many other questions that, uh, you know, people's hands were raised. I think we should do more of such here at the university to have those dialogue and spaces. And so that's what I wanted to say uh, at the outset. Um, two minutes, I don't know whether I can answer everything in two minutes, but let's see. Uh, first of all, let me start from the one that started uh, about tiredness. Um, we all get to a point where we are tired. It's normal, it's natural, it's human, because you're feeling you're trying to move the needle. The needle is not moving as fast as you want it to, to move, and therefore, sometimes there's despair. But I want to encourage three things. First of all, you must fix your eyes on the goals. Why are we here? Why are we doing what we are doing? If you begin to fix your eyes on the goal, I think that the tiredness just leaves you because that gives you the energy to move forward. And then there is no need for polarizers because you are fixing your eyes on the goal. And I think for me, it's inherently contradictory that Africa has everything it takes to prosper, and yet our people wallow in poverty. And therefore, we cannot be tired. Until we change it, until we disrupt things, we cannot be tired. So I think fixing your eyes on the goal becomes very important in terms of dealing with tiredness. We've tried this thing, it's not working, I'm tired. The other thing is to network, to be in a space where you are encouraged by other people, men and women, because iron sharpness, iron, as I say. And therefore, when you surround yourself with the right people, you get tired. You don't get tired. And I call only yesterday two you know, senior leaders who were having a meeting, and I was just like, oh my God, I've, I've had it. I mean, I'm tired. It's 2 a.m., I'm still working. And then in the morning, something just told me, fix your eyes on the goal. So I think that's one way of dealing with the tiredness, fixing your eyes on the goal, and you know, surrounding yourself with the right people, but also asking yourself, what is the legacy that I want to leave? I don't want to just die and just be buried and everybody forgets me. I just want to leave something behind me, and I think that should push us forward. The other question that was addressed to me was around um, mindset, mindset change. How, how do we help with mindset change? And I think that will come with a lot of communication um, and a lot of believing in ourselves. I think many a times um, we see the glass half empty and not the glass half full. And that mindset change is that what is it that we can do? What is it that I can contribute? And it doesn't matter whether you come from a rich family or undeserved family or you know, for a poor family, I think that once we begin to see what is it, and you see the glass half, and that is something that we have to, it's not going to happen just like that. And I'm glad that Professor Nawangwe and team are beginning to have a course here around that. Uh, but beyond the academic dimension, I think there has to be a deliberate effort in terms of building capacity, sharing information, letting people know that you know, it is possible. I personally make it a conscious effort because many a times, uh, even in African clothing, I ask a lot of people here, why don't you wear? There's a sense in which we have to believe in our things and wear them for people to believe in us as well. And so I make it a conscious effort. And, and gradually, I see a number of Ugandans coming to me saying, oh, we like your clothing. And now they're shifting a bit of their own minds around we loving what it is that we own as Africans, including our back cloth, which is one of the things I'll be very, wearing very soon, mindset change. Um, partnerships, what can we do? I think there's a lot of whole communication around, or you know, conversation around partnership. I can't go into all the examples. But partnerships take different levels, uh, and then different, whether it's with civil society, private sector, and others. But let me say one way uh, that we can look at, part or two ways that you can look at partnerships. Partnerships amongst women becomes very important. Mentoring is very important in coaching. For example, if I take our work now as resident representative, UNDP has done an amazing work by bringing its 50-50 uh, parity. So 50% men are represented, 50% women. But for women, uh, for example, to get into that pool, it's not easy. And, uh, and I make it a point myself to try and find which women have applied. Already I know who is going to be applying. Some of them have reached out to them already, so how can I help? And we try to bring a few women in Africa, if it's an African woman, to see how we can support that woman to pass the assessment. That is partnership amongst us, but in a very different way. 
There are days when people are going to make, do interviews on things like that. We have to run, dry runs, mock interviews. And you think that is the real interview, you know, and we don't, you will sweat under our hands. It's partnership to empower other women to make sure that they can break the glass ceiling. That's partnership. So it takes different forms, and I can go on and on. Like I said, if I take, for example, the private sector and the public institutions here, we are doing a fantastic partnership with Stambik Bank, with Nile Brewery, with, uh, with many, many more Macquarie University partnerships around how we can promote gender uh, equality and empowerment. But the most recent thing that excites me, and Professor Sally, I want to wrap up very soon, so pardon me, is uh, Africa has the largest free trade area in the world, 1.4 billion people. Africa only trades amongst itself 16.6% only. So we are importing poverty from other places and exporting our wealth. How many people in Ghana know that Uganda has the best coffee and tea and ghee? And so what we are doing is to promote the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement which says that Africa must trade amongst itself and women are a central part of it. So we are promoting the women's protocol within that agreement. But importantly, as UNDP, we want to send a bunch of Ugandan women to Lagos, to Abuja, to Accra. We say, go and shine your eyes. People still ask me, how do I get ghee? And they don't know that Uganda has ghee. We still send, and last week I sent cheese, a suitcase of cheese from here to Accra. Even vegetables from Nakawa. So why don't we connect the market woman in Nakawa? <laughs> and the Makola woman in Accra. That is partnership amongst African women. So there are different ways of doing those partnerships, but we must be deliberate. Finally, um, men champions. Um, and that's a very powerful one. And we have been very deliberate as well as the UN family. And I know, for example, our sister agency, the UN Women, they had a, a program deliberately identifying male champions in Uganda and making sure that those champions lead the conversation even amongst men and to bring them into the fold when it comes to women's empowerment. So we can't do it alone. We must work with the men. We must uh, identify champions. We must work with cultural leaders, especially, like you said, our, our fellow panelist Anna said, it starts from the family and how we groom, how we support, right from the beginning becomes very important. And I think identifying some of those champions and working with them and communicating whatever we are trying to do is part of the way of bringing men into the fold. I think we don't have enough time to digest, perhaps invite us back again. And my final word, as I, uh, I may not have the opportunity again, I think, um, I think, again, I want to come back to my six piece, and uh, I will not repeat them, but I, I feel very strongly, as a daughter of the soil, uh, as well, that at the time of Africa's development now, at a time that the world is changing, at a time that international politics is changing, at a time that you know, even development finances is shifting because people are fixing their eyes on Ukraine and other spaces because of the poly crisis of the world, at a time that we have the most youthful population on earth uh, in this continent, nine of the growing or the youngest countries in the world today are in Africa and, and Uganda is number two or number three. At this time, we must not look at women's empowerment, gender empowerment, gender equality as a rhetoric or as tokenism. Just put a woman there and it's okay. We must see it as part of at the center of the continent's development. And we must feel very strongly about it. Because until the time that we do that, we'll meet here again 10 years down the line and be saying the same thing. And I want to close with a, 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 a proverb or saying, uh, uh, from South Africa, which says that when you want to go uh, fast, you go alone. But when you want to go further, you go together. We must all go together. And the uh, and, uh, saying of uh, one of our Ghanaian legendaries, when you educate a man, and sorry to the men here, you educate an individual. But when you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsie. Next, we are going to have Martha. Haven't we crossed the Rubicon and your parting shot? Thank you so much for that question. And thank you for the statistics. Actually, statistics is where I shine. So 
Um, I'm glad you asked that question. So if you could give me more statistics, since you seem to have them. Out of those 52 women, 52% 52 of women in the banking industry, how many of them are bank tellers? How many of them are managers? How many of them are CEOs? I think sometimes when men hear women empowerment, they think we are competing with them. It's never a competition. It's just we are trying to enter all spaces. We want to have a right to be in all spaces. So it's not about saying 52% of women are in the banking industry. That's great. They might have counted the cleaners as well. But it will only be OK when they advertise the position for governor and there are five men and five women. That is when it will be enough. So. <laughs> Yes, so it will never be enough until women are in all spaces and places that men have dominated. Because we're equal to you, there is nothing that makes us less than you. I can be an engineer, I can be a lawyer, I can be a welder of a pipeline. There is nothing that differentiates me from you in that space. So it will only be enough. The Rubicon will finally have been reached when we go into offices and it's half men half women, not men are traditionally good at this, so they will be in this. No. What makes them traditionally good at it? Nothing. Women can also be in those spaces. So I hope that has answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Next, you. As for my parting remarks, I didn't come alone. I stand in the shoes of, of course, the esteemed Sarah Intiro Akiki. So I would like to recognize the family that I came with, so please stand so that people can recognize you because you are her legacy, not only me up here. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Lastly, Anna, on Strong Alliances and your parting shots. So many things have been already said. Um, I would like to pick it up from where Martha has left it with don't only look at the numbers as much as we have done so before, but also look really which positions do uh, these women or men have. And there is something, there is even a term to it. And it's called drop to, to the top. So basically that means many women enter all the different spaces um, after acquiring uh, education and they stay there, but then you will see less and less women getting to the top in the same sphere, drop to the top. Um, one barrier that comes and that still uh, really impacts uh, the professional career is then fa family, having a family, giving birth, so how do we react to this? How do we create the spaces? And some examples have been mentioned. Then we have less than even uh, women in what we call C-suit positions, so CEOs and so on. And then up to the top, because then uh, we still have this dominance of, you know, I invite in my space the look like, which is if I, I'm male and you know I come from a certain background, I rather tend to invite somebody to share the space with me, who you know, in whom I might recognize myself as well. And we need to also change just the framework and the uh, structures so that this is uh, this becomes an open space. The cultural aspects, and yes, I hear you when we talk about cultural norms and traditions that can also hinder us in the development, but culture is never static. Culture is also you know, something that we all shape. It evolves constantly. It evolves with our contribution. So what contribution do you make not just say, oh, this is the culture that I 
was born into, but how do you shape in this culture nowadays? What, what will be the culture that your children will born into? I think that matters. As well as when, and somebody has asked uh, whether, um, how can men be, be educated in being promoters of also parity? And good examples have been given. And I again also come back to our own individual responsibility. You might find spaces, networks, groups, and so on that uh, support men um, in becoming uh, engines of female empowerment also. But be the small um, engine in your own family, in your own partnership with your own couple and see whether you can actually challenge some of the beliefs and also of the gender beliefs that your partner has. So have, are you trying in your own individual space really to uh, be equals in your families, partnerships and so on? I think this is also where to start. And last but not least, I really support the idea of networks and um, even at CAS, and this brings me to the institution that I represent, 15 years ago when I entered CAS, it was a very different setting. I found myself um, among many older men. I, I have a migration background. Almost nobody else in that institution had back then. More people with much more conservative views. And I remember um, at a certain time, I, I joined a group also within CAS, or we formed a group uh, of employees under 35. And we, and we celebrate Day of CAS uh, on an annual basis. And so as a young group, we, we um, were thinking, how, what can we do? What would be our contribution? And we decided to show the face of CAS also as the young face of CAS. And everyone was actually surprised from the outside. Oh, we thought it's a very male, conservative, you know, um, institution. But they saw there are many women, there are many young people. And showing it also really, as you were saying, communicating it, 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 it uh, really initiates. In a mindset. So be in the spaces that can also um, initiate um, mind change, um, mindset change. Um, so we, we then had a group of women employees. We, uh, some of us joined a, net, a network that, were call, that was called Women in International Politics and Security and so on. Because these spaces and the mutual um, support, they help. They also help to understand, and with this I conclude, that you don't need always to be strong, right? You can also allow yourself to be weak because everyone goes through these phases and it's normal. But apart from this, apart from the network, and this is also an individual contribution. And with this I really want to end. This afternoon, I was privileged to sit at the uh, lunch table with the queen. And I remember being a girl. My mom was once educating me and um, teaching me table manners. And she told me, you know, Anna, you never know. But one day, you might end up being at the dinner table with a queen. So learn your manners, prepare yourself, invest in your knowledge, invest in your diplomatic skills and any other skills. Thank you so much, because for me, this day was today. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. That was a good way on which to, to end. But let us just remember what I think one of the people has said, empowerment is a collective effort and they need to build strong alliances. And some of these could be as big as the panelists have mentioned, but some of these alliances and the partnerships occur on a daily. 
you cannot underestimate the power, for example, of having a gender-sensitive vice chancellor on a day-to-day. -day. That enables many things, but may not be a big organization that you may recognize like CAS or UNDP. Sometimes it's having strong or supportive mothers-in-law, grandmothers, women friends. Each time we pass in the compound and you see our young students carrying babies, they, their colleagues in class support them. So in as much as we celebrate the big things, let us also remember the small things that are occurring around us on a daily and promote them. So uh, it's not my duty to dilute what the great panelists have said. This is just to ask you to give them another round of applause as we leave the panel. Thank you. And maybe just lastly, please continue sending your questions. The questions for Her Royal Highness will be sent through Dr. Maria Nasali. We shall channel them there, and they will be addressed there. But just to know that also the school operates an East African Learning Collaborative. The other questions for the panelists, please keep sending them. We shall make sure they get to them, and you'll get your responses. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to ensure that the audience is with me. Thank you very much. Yes, that's better. Next, in line with our program, is the signing ceremony, book signing. And I'm honored to invite Owech Tiwa Kotilda Nakate Chikomeko, Minister Owebien Jigiriza, Musaba Ajeko Wano, Asoboro Kuvela Anti Owechitiwa, Tukwa Saganya Echitundu Chino, Bulunji Nyo. Owechitiwa Nakate Chikomeko, Chagenda Okutuya Mbako, Kwe Kuvela Anti Nobu Wombe Fohunji, Aita mama na wagereka Okusobolo kulaba anti omukolo Ogudako Ogokubela anti wali wo Obutabo mama na wagereka Bwagendo okuteka ko omukono Eda abuwe abantu abenja ulo Kuruafe Yes, owechiti watu sanyiso kulaba Obutabo tubulina, ele chigendo kubeda wanti obutabo njia kubusoma, then yoja kubobu tukwa siza mama, then mama naba gedeka ateke kwa mkono, abantu ababa naba basomedwa, basobole okubufuna. Katio wechitiwa, sanyisenyo kulaba, saba mnobu wombefu, otu itide mama naba gedeka. Neanzi zanyo kalabala ba wamekolo, mama wa Uganda, na wageleka Sylvia na Jinda, nsaba nabo wambe funga sina kuita, nsime nyo, mama, umsoma guotuade, ole gulolwa lero kuguto guli rao, ate. Nebio yetu ize, yetu genda okutuala mumaso. Nsaba eronzi kilize nteke mwechiti wa mubona kalabala babe ya yogede mubiti wabi ya mubona avali wano. Atenga mazecho, nsaba onzi kilize ngendeko katono muluzungu mbavuli rechiche nkola mubuganda government. My name is Kotilda Nakate Chikomeko. Uh, Sabasaja's minister in charge of uh, social 
Affairs and also in liaison with the Nabagerika's office. So that is what I do in Boganda government. And uh, in that line, I would like to thank Mama so much for having given us the key note address. I would like to thank her so much for the mud plier effect that has come about through the panelists that have given us the other insights. I would like to thank Makere University for having organized the Sarah Tiro lecture for this year. And would like to thank you all, the congregation, for having respected the invitation and having come to share so that we have yet a multiplier effect in addressing um, this theme that has been given to us, catalyzing change. Resident Representative, United Nations Development Program, Uganda. Kindly come to the podium so that you receive a copy of the signed book. Next is our very own Mrs. Susan Nawangwe. Kindly also come to the stage so that you receive a signed copy from Mama Navagereka. <laughs> Professor Sarah Sally. Yes. That's our very own Mrs. Susan Nawangwe. Pastor. <laughs> okay. Pastor Susan Nawangwe. Yes, um, oh, okay. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> That's beautiful. Next we have Professor Sarah Sally, Dean School of Women and Gender Studies, Makere University, and who has been our able moderator for today. We also expect Mrs. Anna Reisman, country representative, Conrad Adenua Stiftang, Uganda and South Sudan, our major funders for this event, but also key development partners for Makere University, Conrad Adenua Stiftang. May I also request Miss Beatrice Mugambe to also walk to the stage. Miss Beatrice Mugambe. Yes, you're welcome.
we thank Conrad Adenua Stiftung for funding this occasion, but also for being our, when I say our, I mean Makere University Development Partners. Yes, thank you so much. What is going on? It's a book signing by the Nawagereka of Uganda. It's a special day for us here at Makere University to have someone with us who loves women empowerment, development, and quality education for all. She's a champion for quality education, development, and women empowerment. <laughs> Miss Beatrice Mogambe, you're welcome. Yes, to everyone in the audience, we are honored to have Mama Nabagereka with us today. From, if I recall correctly, it was 1 p.m. when we, the Vice Chancellor received the Nabagereka today at Makere University. And we are glad that we are still here, seated at Makere University, Yusuf Lule Central Teaching Facility Auditorium. We also have online audiences we are live streaming on the Makere University YouTube channel. Thank you for following us online. Next is Dr. Suzy Mwanga, Executive Director, Julius Nyerere Leadership Center, a center that is, wow. Yes, I'm glad that the students are clapping. That is. Julius Nyerere Leadership Center at Makere University, very central in empowering our students, student leaders, both male and female. And what has been happening for the last few months, the Julius Nyerere Leadership Center has had several sessions with the Makere University Students Guild to do with empowering the next generation of leaders. That is Dr. Suzy Nansozi Mwanga. Honorable Miriam Matembe. Okay. Okay, I know she was with us. Let us have next Miss Enid Kiza. Miss oh. Enid Kiza, you're welcome. May I also invite Miss Janet Nabukeda. Miss Janet Nabukeda, Human Resource Officer, School of Law and the College of Education and External Studies. Okay. Oh. And Mr. Lubo Wasebina Javira, Manager Makere University Finance and Administration Finance Department.
Her Royal Highness Livia Najinda, the Nara Gereka of Buganda. The moment is signing ceremony at Makere University, Yusuf Lule Central Teaching Facility Auditorium. As the rest of us witness, I'm glad that all the faces I'm looking at are happy faces. Thank you for being happy, jovial. Yes. Miss Janet Nabukera, Human Resource Officer, School of Law and College of Education and External Studies. She also believes in women empowerment, but also during her very special years here, she was a Vice Guild President. Mr. Lubawa Javeda Sevina. Oh, okay. Manager Finance and Reporting, Finance Department, Makere University. He's also ready at the stage. It is an honor for us to witness Mama Nava Gereka signing her book. Then you know what when by Fubunji nyo mama nange kenyini Rita nami sango nsabantu kekao nange mamo kwa seko kukatabo Revali nyo Era tukuyoza eze zanyo bakala balaba olumute Bavira mwao na yetu kuyoza yeze zanyo nyavu. Mkubanga mama agenda na yeku wakatavu. Sabatu mkubire komo ngalo. Irani ntegeze wabo na wafunyo butavo. Na balalaba kukuna vunga wechina lambi kivwa tugenda kufuna echifana njine mama wa Buganda. Echu tuchiwo bugalo. Akiriza mama. Mkuyoza ayoza emusimu nange. Okufuna omukono ogwo mkuru nyo. Nsaba nkudize akazi ndalo. Oh, what are you wearing ya? Nakate Juliet. Tandru la kevi gerevi o muendo. Je na of nakatavo. Nakate mokuvire kwa mongalo. Wearing ya liang. Mirireka. Ma nakate tuafunyeda. Mokuvire kwa mongalo. Wearing ya liang. Ajita taji uomia. Mkuyo zayo ze zanyo. Yes, we are coming to the climax and that is uh, managing photography as I have been guided by the protocol team. So what is going to happen is that the photo moment will take place at the stage where Mama Nava Gereka is. And what is going to happen is that because these are historic photos, I've been guided by protocol, we have specifically five photos. All 
right, uh, members, this is a very special day for us at Makere University. I've been requested that they are people who bought books, right? Now, if you're part of the people seated in the audience and you bought the Navagereka, Queen Sylvia, Najinda Ruswata, an autography, this particular book, and you have a copy, the request is as follows. Very first, write your name in the book, and then come with that book to this. Yes, we have already Ruth Chita Medike. Thank you for buying the book. Any other person who bought a book and you seated in the audience? Okay, so the request, the second re appeal is as follows. I've been guided by your witch tiwa that whoever received this book, you're kindly requested to come to the stage where Mama Navagereka is seated so that you're part of a photo with please come with the book that you received or bought and then so the first photo is dedicated to people who were blessed to receive the signed book by Mama Navagereka and also if you bought a book please come with the book so that we are part of the group photo That was photo one. The next photo, may I request Mrs. Susan Nawangwe to remain where you are? 
So may I request the Vice Chancellor of Makere University to come to the stage. We are now managing the photos as guided by protocol. Together with all the members of Makere Management present, members of Makere University Management present, please join the Vice Chancellor so that you're part of that photo. The Vice Chancellor, Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. Members of Makere University Management present, please join this photo. That is photo number two. Dean's principals, deputy principals, and deans in the room, please join this photo. Just a minute, we still have some people coming in. Deans in the room, principals in the room, deputy principals, please join this photo. And you're smiling on our behalf. On behalf of the audience, on behalf of the online audience, and on behalf of the people who are following us on the live stream. So that is for Makere University Management and you're smiling on our behalf, right? So next, if you know you are a council member and you've been part of that photo, kindly remain where you are. So now let us have a Vice Chancellor, please remain where you're standing. Professor Sadi, remain where you're standing. Next, we are having Makere University Council members. The University Council is the supreme governing body of the university. We are honored that we have Makere University Council members present. Let them join that particular photo. Now, the next photo is a very strategic one. It will involve Honorable Margaret Ziwa, Honorable Maria Matembe, and Honorable Maria Chiwanuka. That is the guidance I received. But if, uh, okay. Yes, Honorable Margaret Ziwa is present. So, very fast, Honorable Margaret Zwa kindly joined the photo. The panelists, the panelists, please come and just after the panelists will be followed very fast in the interest of time by the Sarah and Tiro family. Panelists, very fast. In a minute, let us have the panelists. Next, Sarah and Tido family. And finally, Nkoba Zambogo leaders. Members, we have an issue with time. If I've mentioned your category, okay, that is Mama Nava Gereka with Honorable Margaret Ziwa. I think that has been done. Yes. Next is we have the panelists. The panelists, and as the panelists prepare, we are going to have uh, the Sarah and Tido family next. And finally, Nkoba Zambogo leaders.
So, okay, thank you very much for our dear panelists. Next is um, the Sarah and Tiro family. Um, Princess Katrina, kindly help me join that photo. The one with the Sarah and Tiro family. Wow, <laughs> this is, um, okay. Wow, okay. It's a special day here at Makere University. This is the second Sarah and Tiro annual public lecture at Makere University. Photo moments. Sarah and Tiro family with Mama Navagereka of Uganda. Yes. And um, wow. And we. Yes, Sarah and Tiro, thank you for. So, and our last photo will be with the Nkoba Zambogo leaders and their set. Nkoba Zambogo leaders, thank you so much for all the mobilization. Saint everyone, Nkoba Zambogo. Sent everyone, Koba Zambogo. No which Tibo will be in Jigiriza, which Tibo and Nakatech Komeko to Kusaba over the Muchfan and Yecho. Koba Zambogo, Mueva de Mirimujo Naja Mukose. Finally, finally, Makere University Students Guild, you should by now be here. Makere University Students Guild in one minute. Makere University Students Guild in a minute. That's the last photo. Makere University Students Guild. Um, Saint Eben Koba Zambogo, thank you very much together with your dear team. And finally, Makere University Students Guild as we prepare for the anthems. And also protocol requests that after the anthems, the rest of us will remain seated to allow our chief guest together with the Vice Chancellor and the entire dignitaries to leave the auditorium first, then we will follow. Makere University Students Guild, in one minute that photo should be done, you assured me. That is the 89th, right? Students Guild. And you're smiling on behalf of all the students from other universities. Yes? You're smiling on behalf of the students of Makere University stu and students from other universities. So, the School of Performing Arts and Film, kindly get ready. And in line with protocol after the anthems, this is what is going to happen. The rest of us will take our seats and we'll allow Mama Nava Gereka together with our host, the vice the auditorium first, then the rest of us will follow. Before the anthems, let us all rise and put our hands to us.
Yes, thank you so much. Let us have the anthems. We are being led by Makere University School of Performing Arts and Film under the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. The head of department is Dr. Benon Chigozi and he's leading the choir. Thank you.
of us, let us take our seats. Kindly remain seated. Kindly take your seats. Yes, we have the Vice Chancellor of Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, who has been our host, leading the dignitaries out of Makere University Yusuf Lule Central Teaching Facility. Thank you so much for turning up our physical participants and also our online participants who have been following this event. We have come to the end, a happy end of the second Sarantiro public lecture at Makere University. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being a very wonderful audience. From 1 p.m. 